Good afternoon, and welcome to a CIO's Guide to Hybrid Cloud Infrastructure, Understanding the Potential Benefits and Path Forward, a health system CIO Media Inc. production sponsored by NetApp. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Health System CIO, and I will be your moderator today. We're going to have some fun interactive features. One is our agree or over-the-top poll. Then we hope you'll send in questions and comments in the Q&A box. Send them in during the event, and we'll take them later in the program. And you could download the deck by using the URL on your screen, and it's been sent out in the chat box. Just so you see how we're going to spend our time today, first we're going to go about 35 or so minutes with our panel discussion featuring David Chow, CIO of the Live Medical Group, Doug McMillan, IT Director with Cone Health, and Brian Pruitt, Senior Healthcare Strategic Alliance Manager with NetApp. And then we're going to have our Q&A. So without any further delay, let's jump right in to what I'm sure is going to be a fun conversation. Um, let's get an overview of your organization and role. David, why don't we start with you? Yeah, so thanks for having me, guys. Anthony is pronounced Lou Ye, Lou Ye, not Lai, Lou Ye. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Lou Ye. Sorry, David. <laughs> you should have told me. <laughs> Go ahead. They are a pharmaceutical company based out of Singapore that has 50 plus sites throughout Australia, Singapore, and China. And there's two facilities that's being built in conjunction with the Cleveland Clinic. So I'm helping them um, put together the strategy and the implementation plan for the Cleveland Clinic initiative while also providing oversight for the other hospital. Concurrently, I also get to advise a lot of Fortune 500 companies with go-to-market strategies. All right. Excellent, David. Thank you. Doug? Uh, yes, I work for Cone Health. We're a healthcare organization in Greensboro, North Carolina. Uh, we have about 13,000 employees, uh, around 2,000 providers, five hospitals, and around 200 ambulatory clinics. Uh, I'm currently the director of IT technical operations, which covers uh, the data center, cloud, network, VoIP, VTC, service management, uh, server administration, integrations, and security and access management. All the fun stuff, right? Uh, if you call it fun. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Brian? Yeah, so I, I'm, uh, I work for NetApp. Uh, NetApp is a hybrid cl cloud data management ser service uh, headquartered in Sunnyvale, California. So we're a Fortune 500 uh, organization founded in 1992. Um, kind of making that transition from uh, you know, the traditional storage vendor uh, to more of a data management uh, and data services company. So in my role, I'm a strategic healthcare alliance manager for NetApp, responsible for just the overall uh, alignment and strategic direction for Epic and their customers. So we're meeting with Epic teams on a weekly basis to just help drive that innovation, understand the Epic roadmap, and really articulate that unique value that, that we provide for, for Epic deployments. So I, I'm fairly new to NetApp. I've been at NetApp for about four months now. I've spent the last five years on the provider side at Centura Health. Centura is a 17 hospital IDN in Colorado. Um, there I led uh, pretty large IT uh, architecture teams that were responsible for delivering you know, those resilient solutions for over 23,000 associates and that uh, leading that charge for the transition from Meditech to Epic. So thanks for having us. Excellent. All right, uh, next question. Let's define and give some examples of infrastructure complexity. What does it mean and how does it come about despite the desire to prevent it? Uh, Doug, let's start with you. Yeah, so I, I, as soon as I see infrastructure complexity, it just reminds me of kind of where we've been and where we're going. Uh, so a, a lot of the traditional on-premises uh, uh, infrastructure, which uh, for Cone Health uh, was mostly around the converged infrastructure for a very long period of time. Just led to numerous uh, issues with trying to be able to prov uh, provide upgrades and updates as 
the business needs kept changing. Uh, so a couple of things like that is making sure that you have this infinite, and I'll just use matrix of compatibility matrices uh, that are sitting out there for SAN backups, UCS, vSphere. And as you were trying to grow your environment, you would actually get into the issue where you wouldn't just need to upgrade vSphere, but then all of a sudden that led to, okay, you need to upgrade UCS. That, oh, now you need to upgrade your SAN. And it just kept, started kept trickling backwards. Uh, and throughout all of that, each one of these are also tied to physical infrastructure. Therefore, it took you so long to go through the procurement process and get it in and get it ready before you could even start to deliver the value. Uh, and now, as you're looking at the hybrid cloud infrastructure, bringing in these new features and functionality, you can actually start to deliver much faster and kind of retool, refactor everything uh, kind of on the fly and not have to go through so many layered upgrades because the cloud provider is handling that for you. All right, very good, David. So to just uh, keep it very simple, every healthcare organization is, has a complexity problem with the infrastructure, whether it's outdated equipment, whether it's bad design, or just um, they need to really think about the future. So what we just discussed right now is they pretty much what I see across the board in terms of not being able to scale. So challenge number one is how do organizations scale quickly? Number two, is how do they do in an effective way to where their engineers are also aware of the latest technology. So the combination of not being able to scale, the combination of not having the right talent is something that healthcare organizations are facing today. And that's the that's how I would summarize the complexity. Now we can get into the technical discussion on later on as far as what's the best solution out there. Is it you know, hybrid, is it SD-WAN? Um, but when I think about from a simplistic point of view, the ability to scale and have the right talent is the challenge that we're facing from an infrastructure standpoint. All right, very good. Next question, give me some examples of how efforts to reduce this complexity if done wrong might lead to a reduction in flexibility, accessibility, and performance. So everything you're trying to accomplish, is there a way you can try and go about doing this that'll take you in the opposite direction or cause you different problems that may be just as bad? Uh, Brian? I think so as you know historically IT infrastructure teams would would work in silos right you would have your uh, VMware team you would have a storage team you would have uh, a security team you, you see that transition from the siloed approach not only from the infrastructure perspective but also from the IT teams and the way that they're organized so now we're, we're kind of shifting that that dynamic to more of a consolidated team approach to where you have more of IT generalists, right? So no longer do you have these separate teams for virtualization, virtualization storage, end user computing, you know, database administrators, cache admins, you know, in this, in this new world, in my opinion, this new world of this hybrid cloud approach, not only is the IT architecture consolidating, but, but so are the teams, right? So you see more of the IT cloud architects, the IT generalists, as opposed to these vendor specific roles. So when these, when healthcare systems are going down the path of, you know, the hybrid cloud service delivery model for healthcare, you know, I, I think it's absolutely critical for these teams to be on the same page. And, you know, it requires a shift in mindset because we've been delivering IT services the same way for so long and, you know, times are changing. Um, the transition has to happen. All right, very good, David. So I would say the transition has to happen to where it has to be driven toward, moved towards software. Um, software is driving everything and we have to think about the infrastructure from a software's perspective. That means using software to control access, using software as the central focal point into driving how you want your network to flow. Um, that's a very different perspective versus traditional IT infrastructure to where your engineers are used to for example, configuring the router, setting up the routing tables. Now, in order to scale effectively, in order to make those changes efficiently and really in real time, you could have a centralized point of view utilizing the software. So I would say software is gonna be um, the future and the technology is already there. I mean, software defined X, whether it's the network or the WAN has been in production for quite some time, but the adoption has been slow. So I would definitely encourage 
healthcare organizations to think software defined first as their future generation um, network infrastructure and, and architecture. So you even used the phrase, David, software defined. Is that what you said? Yes. Do you want to go into that a little more? It sounds like this is a big, you know, overarching point you're making here. Yeah. So, you know, software defined network and software defined WAN has been on the market for the last, I'll say, six plus years. Um, and there's really, it comes down to being able to utilize a central point uh, of view um, where you're using software to drive the traffic for your entire enterprise on the network side. Um, it is something that's, I don't see healthcare organizations take advantage of as frequently as they should. Um, but definitely if you think about the future, it's having that single point of view, having the ability to make changes on the fly and being able to redirect however you want your network to flow. And most importantly, now you have the ability to secure the organization because you could really redirect traffic or bad traffic on demand utilizing a software platform. So those are things I'm encouraging organizations to think about um, when they, when, in terms of software defined uh, architecture. And it's not a new phrase that I, I came up with. It's been in the market for quite some time. Mm. Is there a reason, David, you think that uh, you said you don't see a lot of healthcare organizations taking advantage of this? What's the reason? Change management. Um, there's a change management that needs to happen with your staffing line, staff and you have to upskill them to think a little bit differently in terms of the latest architecture. You also have to change your design almost completely. So anytime there's change, you're gonna expect some downtime. I would say lots of organizations do want, don't want to take any risk of downtime. So definitely when you move towards this new infrastructure, there will, something will happen, something will go down. But if you look at the positive side of it, your impact that you will have on the organization is so much greater and that potential downtime. So I think the combination of uh, managing the risk and having um, the, this change management, that, that's, the, that's, that's the killer where I don't see organizations moving towards it as fast. You know, I sit, oh, I sit in a good spot where I could tell people this is what need, needs to be done, but the politics <laughs> behind the healthcare organization, it is really complex. I mean, how can you go to an organization? Number one, you need to get more budgets because this is a something new that's gonna require investments and you will have some savings in the future by um, shifting the cost from your current, I'll use your current circuit to a software defined circuit, but there's some time that um, needs to happen in terms of the ROI. And then second, you have to go to the board to ask for a lot of money in order to make those investments. So that's hard. Brian, I see you nodding your head a lot in agreement. Uh, what are your thoughts? Oh, I, I completely agree with uh, change management is a, is a huge piece of this, but at the end of the day, how are you transforming the delivery of IT services that eventually direct, directly impact patient care, right? So kind of challenging that status quo, if you will, of you know, understanding what opportunities are out there, what problems are you trying to solve? Is it um, delivering services faster to the business? Is it more resilient IT architecture and infrastructure? Um, but I agree, change management is a, is a huge piece of it, but I, I would also challenge the, the listeners to, um, to challenge the status quo. Um, th there's a different way. Technology is, is evolving rapidly. There's, you know, every, every day we hear new exciting announcements coming out. I think, you know, healthcare uh, traditionally is kind of that laggard in the market. So I think, um, you know, there's, there's an opportunity here to to understand what that current run rate is for IT spend and how you can eliminate legacy IT architecture and transition to more modern uh, technologies. Doug, I also see you uh, nodding your head in agreement. Um, anywhere you want, jump in on, on the things that David and Brian had said, and, and even, you know, more, make sure you specifically address what David was saying about, you know, David's been in the chair that you're in uh, and the CIO chair, and he's, so he knows what needs to be done, but he also understands the difficulty of getting it done on the ground with the logistics and the politics and the budgeting and all everything. So wherever you want to address there, just jump in. Yeah. So in, uh, 
I'm, I'll tie a couple of things together as well. So I think uh, one of the things that we were talking about is that IT generalist in moving and then talking about the infrastructure as code or software defined. Uh, so, and, and we're right in the middle of a lot of this at our organization. So we, we just actually uh, underwent a large project. We moved our Epic, Epic disaster recovery environment to Azure. Uh, we went live in October. Uh, we're actually migrating a full, uh, uh, we're moving over to run production out of that disaster recovery environment as of next week. Um, so throughout that whole process, we had to go through a lot of these conversations, which is budget conversations. Uh, we, we know that you, you've got to be able to uh, have some sort of ROI and with a disaster recovery environment that there's lots of options available there because you don't need to run all the infrastructure if you don't need it. And then you use that software and that code to be able to burst and, and scale up as needed when needed. Uh, so uh, that was one of our initial forays, but tying that together, we had to go back and teach some of our legacy infrastructure people how to actually now be coders because they have to be able to deliver that with software and that's a completely different unique skill set for them. Uh, however, you immediately start to see some of the walls break down between the teams. So you see things like you had a storage area network admin, you had a, a server admin. Now, well, both of those people could be the exact same role who is also defining that based off of policy and software. Uh, so, uh, you know, and again, this, I think to the point that I would add to the question, I think what we ask is uh, what happens if you don't do it wrong uh, or what some of the, those issues may be is making sure you start this process with a clear strategy of what you're trying to accomplish. Because if you're doing it just kind of willy nilly or just picking one little use case, but you're not really thinking about a strategy, you could end up heading down one path and then having to come back and rework it because it didn't fit the overarching strategy for the organization. So Doug, more about this needing a strategy. Um, just give me more color how people can get that wrong. They're just doing it for you know one-off reasons. They're not, there's no overarching Correct. plan. Correct. And, and Any I more actually, about that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So uh, I actually uh, attended the Gartner's uh, conference uh, where they were talking about this, and it was very interesting to, to listen to it. Is uh, uh, they one of their main questions was, okay, who has which organization? Just raise your hands, and I think they had an online poll. Uh, who has an actual written cloud strategy? It was very, very, very low. Uh, now, I think every organization already has some concept of what they're trying to accomplish, but actually just taking the time to sit down and physically write it out helps you kind of forecast kind of what the projects and what little changes are gonna be needed along the way to make it to the end goal. Uh, so, and, I, and I'm not uh, saying that Cone Health uh, is not in the same boat. Uh, we had desires and we had, you know, ideas, but we had to sit back and, you know, say, step back and say, okay, well, what are we really trying to accomplish? And it's all about the business. You're really trying to meet those business initiatives more effectively and more efficiently with the staff and the tools that are at your uh, uh, disposal. So, taking the time to just map that process out and and, and then come in is because uh, you'll hear a lot of organizations that you say we're you know we're cloud first no that's not really a strategy that's that's more of a tactic uh, and again is and it's making sure that you really understand the difference that is a tactic but it's not a strategy very good hey, uh, David you, David tell me what, tell me what do you think of that no, that's spot on. I think, you know, it definitely it is a tactic. Um, the challenge, here's a challenge with cloud. When we talk about moving towards a cloud, something Clone Health had to do, um, Doug and his boss, Ben, is you have to restructure your engineers. There's no set, now your engineers are becoming cloud engineers. That's a very different ball game. And the way you start transitioning just job descriptions towards um, where you want to move towards, that, that has to be part of the strategy. So the teams, and then most importantly, what problem are you trying to solve? Uh, most of the time when people want to move to, towards the cloud, they can't answer that question. What problem are you really trying to solve? Are you trying to reduce your capital expenditure? Are you, is it okay to increase your operational expenditure, expenditure? Because that may be also be a problem when your operational expenses go up and hit your P&L. Or are you really looking to have the scale and the agility? Uh, I would say, you know, you, 
defining the ability to scale quicker and having agility, that's definitely the move towards the cloud. It's not about cutting yeah. costs because you may not save money. Uh, you may right. actually spend more dollars, um, but it's okay because now I'll use HR term, you're having your employees operate at the top of their licensure. We'd love to use that term in healthcare. <laughs> that means your, your, your staffing are operating effectively and that there's an ROI in that. But if you're really looking at taking out cost by going to cloud, it's not gonna happen. So I do agree with, when we talk about the strategies is we tend to really look at the tactics without defining why we're doing it and, we're, and then without defining the overall picture. So if I were to define a strategy that includes cloud, it would be something around the term, we're gonna scale faster, we're gonna be able to add more facilities as we go through mergers and acquisitions. And beneath that, all the various tactics come along with the technology solutions such as cloud, hyper cloud, software defined. So definitely spot on. And that's, that's a really big shift for CIOs to think about because many grew up in the tactical world. They grew up as directors that has been transformed to a CIO who are now expected to be business leaders. So very different mentality and the good ones are able to articulate that. Right? They're able to go to the board and be able to tell that right story. And, but there are still a lot that needs that uh, assistance into shaping their, their format of storytelling. Excellent, very good. All right, next question, David, I'm actually gonna stick with you. What are some effective ways to reduce infrastructure complexity and what role can hybrid cloud play in an organization's overall strategy? Well, this is a big uh, statement I'm gonna make. A lot of these commodities, if I would prefer to utilize managed service. Um, I, I think we're in an era to where your staff just should not be managing commodities. So that's one play that I am definitely recommending to lots of organizations I talk to is looking at managed service, especially from an infrastructure standpoint. You know, things like network configuration, you just should not do that in the house anymore. Now, it's a very bold statement. It's a very hard thing for a lot of organizations to swallow, especially the large health systems who are major employers, because imagine the news that goes in the press when we talk about a shift towards a managed service, um, that's, a, that's a bad press. But for me, it's really about utilizing partner relationships and utilizing uh, organizations that can just do this a lot better than I could. Um, I would definitely trust NetApp over software defined over hybrid cloud versus my internal staff and have my internal staff really focus on business opportunities by utilizing technology rather than um, be sort of the, the gatekeeper and the engineers of technology. So I would say that's one philosophy a very bold philosophy, a philosophy that I definitely recommend to reduce complexity and really try to shape and shift how uh, IT is run in the healthcare systems. Excellent, Doug. Yeah, so in uh, the commodity-based comment, I'd, I'd love, you know, I, we think about this a lot. And uh, again, just thinking about how cloud is used, obviously we've got SaaS, IaaS and PaaS. So we've got a, a lot of different offerings that are there. Uh, and I agree, you know, commodity based things, not things that we should be focusing on because it doesn't bring good value to the organization to, you know, to expend their uh, human capital resources to be able to, you know, take the time and effort to manage these things. Uh, so obviously, and I think immediately, you know, not just managed service, but SaaS offerings. I mean, that's a perfect example is just, you know, if, if and I'll use Kronos time and attendance, you know, okay, it's kind of a commodity based application. There's not much that you're really trying to do there other than just, you know, do your time and attendance tracking and maybe some scheduling. Okay, let's shift that out to the cloud and move to a SaaS offering. No point in housing that on prem and having to take that time and effort. Uh, the only caution that I always think of there when, especially because a SaaS offering seem to pop up uh, or at least request in our organization all the time. Uh, I, I get a little concerned is to making sure again coming back to that strategy conversation is always be careful of where the data is. Uh, because if it comes into a, a situation where you think you might need that data again for some additional analytics, well then do they offer up the open APIs to be able to get that data back or to use it and ingest it into a data warehouse? So I think there's always a data conversation that needs to be had uh, as a kind of a governance to SaaS. Uh, but uh, again, that openness APIs, just being able to shift things around and again, move up the stack. And I think that's where you hear a lot of people uh, talking about for their engineers is uh, don't focus down on the, you know, the nuts and bolts around the infrastructure, the storage, the disks, it's move them up the stack to get them towards the application layer because that's really where the business sees value. 
Anthony, can Very I just good. jump in to answer yeah, one please. thing? So yep. as what we're seeing in the software industry is everything's moving towards a SaaS offering mm -hmm. too. Uh, the subscription model will be the trend. So let's use ERP as an example. Um, the next generation cloud ERP, it will be a SaaS offering. You will not even be able to have it on premise unless you're such a large player that you could demand that. But majority of the clients will be moving towards the SaaS offering, just as Doug had mentioned with Chrono. So that will definitely be the trend uh, in the industry where it will be software um, sort of uh, as, a, um, as a SaaS model. So now the challenge for executives um, leading technology and healthcare arena is now you have to orchestrate and manage all these different environments. So the next generation is gonna be about managing these cloud to cloud integration, managing all the various SaaS environments and how do they integrate with each other, which is very different than what's being handled right now on premise majority of the time with a few cloud offerings. So there is definitely gonna be a shift where we will see a lot more SaaS offering where that's gonna be the majority and a lot more public cloud usage. So um, really resonates with our discussion of what is the hybrid cloud strategy for the future. Brian, your thoughts? Yeah, j just to add on to that. So I, I completely agree with, with David. I think at the, at the end of the day, it's what problems are you trying to solve, right? So whenever I was at Centura Health, we, were, we had a directive to reduce our OPEX by over $300 million over five years, right? So that, that kind of forced IT to think differently about how we delivered IT services to the business. So after collaborating with, you know, with the rest of the, the IT teams and leadership and architecture teams and you know, doing our in-depth analysis, you know, we determined that a hybrid cloud approach was, was the best fit for us. And you know, some organizations are more uh, OPEX heavy versus CAPEX. You know, I think the, um, the financing principles and the gap laws are changing a little bit to where you can start capitalizing cloud, right? If you're an OPEX heavy or OPEX light organization, trying to reduce that as much as possible, hybrid cloud approach is, is somewhat difficult to articulate to a, a CFO that's wanting to um, improve EBITDA as much as possible, right? And reduce that OPEX. So gap laws are changing to where you can start capitalizing these, this cloud spend and it, it kind of, it, it's a shift in uh, the way that we've always thought about it, right? So, you know, we, we took that hybrid cloud approach because, you know, the IT spend and infrastructure was very unpredictable. Um, we were going through quite a few mergers and acquisitions. So we had no idea what we were bringing into the IT organization. Um, we could we could get a notification that a week from now we're bringing on a new hospital. Well, we have to be able to dynamically scale our infrastructure based on that demand. So the hybrid cloud approach was was a perfect fit for us. Very good, very good. <clears throat> All right, next question, Doug. Let's go with you on this. Who in a health system is usually leading the the charge on HCI transformation? Is it the CIO? And if not, um, what is the CIO's role in affecting change here? Uh, so in our organization, it is the CIO and the CTO uh, kind of in partnership that have been kind of pushing forward the HCI transformation. Uh, and obviously it goes up uh, to the CIO as well because our CIO recently was moved to our executive uh, leadership team. Uh, so they are obviously driving how the IT strategy overall will fit into the business strategy. Uh, and then obviously when it starts getting down into more now of the cloud strategy, the CTO is there as well to be able to tie into the IT strategy, which again flows all the way back to the business strategy. But I think that's the, the key. Uh, I, I'm not sure and I won't speak to how other healthcare organizations are, are running that transformation. Uh, maybe some of the chief digital officers, I, I could see that probably our chief transformational officers come in. Uh, but at that point for us is, you know, that clear line to making sure that our individual cloud strategy maps all the way back up to the business initiatives that are coming out, which obviously includes a large push on digital health and consumerism. David, uh, what have you seen and what do you recommend? What do you think works best in terms of, you know, everyone's got, people have all different kinds of C-suites now. Uh, we mentioned chief digital officer, chief trans transformation officer. So, every organization almost is going to have a different grouping in the C-suite, let alone what flows down into IT after the CIO on down. Um, so your thoughts there on what works best? Yeah, I love the C-suite alphabet soup on huh? that thing. Yeah. <laughs> yep. So 
when, when we talk about HCI, I'm assuming we're talking about hyper-converged infrastructure. That has to be definitely led by a technologist. It has to be an initiative led by a CTO level, supported and sponsored by the CIO. Here's the reality. I don't see a lot of organizations even know what HCI stands for. So that is definitely an education um, curve that needs to happen. People need to think about the flexibility and the scalability of having a hyper-converged infrastructure. But when we talk about a transformation for the organization, just because you hire a chief transformation officer or a chief digital officer, doesn't mean that individual can transform the organization. And that's a really tough role. Uh, I've seen lots of organizations where the battle begins, where you have a chief digital officer, you have a CIO, and they're trying to figure out who is gonna do the cool projects, who has the funding, who's got the resources. But the challenge is the CIO, no matter what, because of the history, they have the funding and they have the people. So they have the resources to pull it off, but then you're fighting with a chief digital officer who may come in because they're, they have done some great things that are the organization that has transformed uh, institution. They're coming in without the proper resources. So now, how do you pull those off? How do you create that synergy? So that's a very constant battle that I'm seeing. And what typically happens is the CIO resorts to being the infrastructure leader and the chief digital officers is driving these business execution process, projects using technology and they throw it over the fence to the CIO to implement. So that is not a healthy environment, but that is a very common scenario that we're seeing today. And so I would say when it comes to driving transformation, it has to be an, an organization an initiative. I'm hopeful and I would love to see my CIO friends and peers really try to drive that and take control of that before allowing another individual to come into an organization to drive that transformation. I really truly believe the CIO is in the best position, um, but they really need to elevate uh, their executive presence, to elevate the storytelling and really think in terms of driving business output rather than being a maintainer of all the various technologies in the, in the organization. So, very different mentality, but in terms of the driver, there's so many different people that could drive it. It's hard to say it's one individual, but I'm just seeing so many conflicts right now with organizations with the C-suite alphabet suit. Yeah, real quick, a follow-up there, uh, David, it's very interesting, is if you were looking at a role uh, that would be one of the alphabet soup jobs, other than the CIO, but again, a C-suite level job, let's call it the alphabet soup jobs, um, it, could you see on paper trouble? So, for example, if you see that the job is chief transformation officer and you have no budget and you have no staff and you have to go to the CIO to get anything done, would that be a red flag for you? It's not necessarily a red flag. Um, I mean, there's definitely a lot of benefits, too, depending on the organization. But uh, I think they do that as a influencer role. So, meaning, can you come influencer. into an organization to influence decisions across the organization? without having direct authority, a very hard role to, to really tackle. And I've seen a lot of these, I've talked to a lot of organizations with, that are recruiting for these influencer type roles to where highly matrix, you have no direct accountability, but somehow you have to drive the outcome. So <laughs> definitely red flag for some, but some people are able to pull yeah. off, which is why the role exists. Um, but I would say these type of roles are probably the ones that typically get cut uh, and there's a comedy <laughs> downtime. So be prepared two, three years, make the money, and, and then two, three years, something may happen. So that's the red Brian, that's the caution. Brian, yeah. you look like you want to jump in. Do you yeah, want to be an influencer, I, Brian? <laughs> <laughs> I always want to be an influencer. No, I, I, I agree with David, but I, I would expand on that just a little bit. I think the CIO should, or CTO, whomever it is, should identify those thought leaders within the organization that really have that uh, a finger on the pulse of, the latest developments in technology, right? Because it's it's almost impossible for these the C-suite to keep up to date with the latest developments. I think I think it's going to be key for these um, these directors and above to to really identify who in their organization can help drive the change, identify those problems that need to be solved, and then be that cheerleader for the IT teams moving forward. And, and can I All add right. one comment? Oh, please. Yeah, so it, and it was one of the uh, things that David said. It, it was very, I guess, impactful for me because we, we see a lot of this at, uh, with some of the partners that we're dealing with at other uh, healthcare organizations as well. Uh, and it was uh, the comment around uh, the maintaining. Uh, so 
I think that's a large m misconception around what ITS or IT does in general is they feel like we're just a maintenance organization. Uh, and that's a large transformation in itself to knowing that, well, IT can actually bring a lot of business value and solutions, not just maintain everything that you've purchased. And that, that to me is a very key uh, focus that all organizations really need to be making. Yeah, it's and kind of, next, just, to, just to add on to that, I think it's, it's kind of making that shift from an ad hoc IT department of just this, this massive business overhead to more of that uh, business enabler, right? How are you solving those those massive business problems to help impact change? I think that's that transformation. Uh, it, in my opinion, it has to happen. All right, very good. Next question, uh, Brian. Let's stick with you on this. How can success be measured around uh, HCI transformation in areas like IT operations, total cost of ownership, and delivery of care? Sure, I think going back to what I just previously mentioned about changing that perception of IT and, and doing polling of how are you directly impacting um, patient care? How are you Im improving the the day-to-day -day tasks of the of the caregivers in the in your organization, right? So are you streamlining the delivery of IT services, um, which not only transforms the perception of IT to the business, but also directly impacts that, that patient care, right? So doing surveys and polls, um, looking for alternatives. So when you're talking TCO, um, understand what your, your current run rate is. Understand you know, the, the maintenance agreements you have in place with all of your legacy IT infrastructure and, and look for alternatives. You know, see, what's, see what's out there, challenge that status quo. Um, and really at the end of the day, you know, how are you impacting the, the caregivers? I think that's having a finger on the pulse and, and getting out to, to each of your facilities, getting feedback from, from physicians, from RNs, from supply chain, whoever it is, uh, getting that feedback is, is key. Very good, David. You know, the, this, these types of transformation, these types of solutions, you're measuring experience. It's really hard to have a direct measure on experience, positive experience. How do you measure that? So, you know, in addition to what Brian had mentioned, just getting a pulse out on the environment, I would say, try to think about some specific measurements that you could present. For example, if you're in a mergers and acquisition growth mode, the ability to spin up a new environment for a new facility, if you could do it in two days versus 20 weeks, that's a measurement in itself. So being able to present that in that fashion is very critical and that can show some positive ROI. But the toughest part about some of the technology solutions is, is in, we're, in, we're trying to measure experience. So I would definitely recommend organizations to think a little bit beyond uh, the soft ROIs and try to get to something tangible depending on uh, the mode that your organization is in, whether you're in acquisition mode or whether you're in status quo mode or the worst kind, which is you're trying to sell all your assets. But those are the three modes your organization are definitely in currently. And think about how you can measure um, based upon those, those sort of scenarios. Yeah, because David, sometimes soft ROI is only going to get you so far, especially with CFO types, right? I mean, you're going to hit that wall and they're going to say, well, if that's all you've got, forget it. Exactly. Very good, Doug. <laughs> so the couple of things that I guess I would expand on. So I think the time to look to delivery is a, is a very easy metric to be able to measure. Uh, again, back thinking back to the traditional infrastructure. Uh, I mean, it could be again months for procurement and you're waiting for that hardware upgrade that you, all that goes away and you could have that in a matter of minutes and or days. Uh, so that, that, that to me is, you know, one of the big keys. Uh, other things that I think, uh, uh, just thinking from a business perspective, is sometimes uh, uh, it was costly, specifically with on-prem infrastructure because of the way that uh, you just needed to architect the solution to provide uh, business continuity disaster recovery. Uh, well, again, now that you have the cloud options where you can spin things up, have them powered off, uh, use code to be able to burst and things like that, uh, disaster recovery actually becomes a very, you know, I want to say inexpensive, but less expensive option than what it was for on-prem. Uh, so that immediately brings in business value, uh, which again, you have to 
that's for the organization to to weigh whether that's a soft cost or not. Uh, and then is it just thinking of cloud and the, the way that the software uh, is continually changing and at a, at a rapid rate that we've never seen before. Uh, being able to get to some of those new innovations, uh, uh, software innovations like you know AI, ML, uh, you know blockchain, all these things that we know that are they're coming and they're going to have you know huge ramifications to our industry you can actually get those faster by using the cloud-based services as opposed to trying to build them out yourself. All right, excellent. We're gonna do our poll now, which I just launched. So everybody, including our panelists, please weigh in on that. So this is our agree or over the top bowl, poll. So you're gonna to answer to each, each question. CIOs are nowhere near as knowledgeable as they need to be when it comes to hyperconverged infrastructure. Uh, HCI transformation must be actively led by CIOs. This is not something that can be delegated. Do you agree with that or is it over the top? And the CIO of the future, and I believe this is what David said, so let's see if people agree with him. The CIO of the future will be a master of managing multiple cloud vendors. So go ahead and answer that and then we will come back in a moment and look at that. But we're going to go to my other favorite feature, ask a co-panelist, and I'm going to start with Brian and give him an opportunity to ask Doug and David a question. It can be the same for both or a different question for each. Brian, go for it. Yes, yeah, yeah, so I think a different question for each. So uh, I, I was really excited to have Doug on this call because, you know, him and his team and what they're doing at, at Cone Health is it's very forward thinking. Um, they're kind of they're, they're challenging that status quo. Um, I think my question to Doug would be, what challenges have you seen in making that shift from, you know, traditional IT service delivery to more of that hybrid cloud approach and getting your teams on board with that, that shift? What are some of those some of those challenges? So, so two of the biggest and one we've already covered, I'll start with it is that the refactoring and skill sets. Uh, so uh, when we we looked at this about a year and a, maybe a year and a quarter ago uh, of you know we were, we were hitting a perfect storm where we knew we were going to have to uh, do a complete refresh of all of our epic infrastructure uh, and I'm talking all the way down to UCS blades Citrix uh, the we were running on AIX at the time and it, 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 the sand itself it was like oh my goodness here we go it's 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 an all um, so when we started looking at this, we really started digging in and we could see the potential for the uh, ROI again because of disaster recovery. That's really what we were looking at, uh, you know, in our initial scope. Uh, but the the biggest challenge again is uh, here. I had my infrastructure engineers who, you know, some of them are, are very well, you know, versatile people. So they had already had some of these skill sets. Some of them were not. Uh, and luckily our partners through this process stepped up and, and did a tremendous amount of training uh, to get us up to up to speed as fast as possible to be able to make this shift. Uh, the other thing, and I'll just speak for, you know, uh, Cone Health does not have a large development shop. So we have unfortunately a lot of just custom off the shelf purchase applications, Epic being one of them. So you're kind of beholden to your vendors uh, because they're also not ready at that point to be able to change to a cloud-based architecture as opposed to a traditional on-prem infrastructure. Uh, so those are the kind of largest challenges we're seeing. And again, yes, we, we, we were successful with migrating our Epic DR environment, but we've already moved a good 35 other smaller workloads and we're continuing to just push that forward uh, because we see the value that it could bring. Uh, but uh, uh, I think to David's point is that ROI, at some point you may look at a workload and know that it's, it's probably a little more expensive and that's where the conversation comes in is maybe it's more expensive, but the flexibility that you get warrants that additional expense because you can move so much faster. All right, Brian, you had a question for David. Yeah, so for David, uh, assuming that uh, the HIMSS conference is, is moving forward and we're actually going to be in the Orlando mm -hmm. next week, uh, you know, with with David being, you know, extremely involved in, in HIMSS and other um, healthcare um, communities, you know, what what's that what's that thing that you're looking forward to most about about hymns next week? 
I'm really looking forward to just catch up with Anthony. I mean, that's probably <laughs> goal number one. We're going to have Anthony. a lot of fun. <laughs> Always have a lot of fun, David. <laughs> I, I meant to. I meant to preface that. Besides golf. Besides golf. <laughs> besides uh, golf. <laughs> so we're gonna see. There's gonna be a lot of discussion this year. The biggest buzzword that you're gonna hear is ambient. I don't know whether you have picked up on that already. So it's like the next key phrase that's gonna be hitting. So Epic came out with this ambient experience uh, for communication. Nuance came out with this ambient clinical intelligence offering. So now. Everything's about ambient. They're moving from AI to this ambient experience to where um, it's kind of like Netflix, right? When you think about Netflix, you get these um, recommendations. Now, it's it's not really in your face all the time, but it comes up on your phone. It comes up when you log in. And that's why they're trying to um, put together sort of this next best action from it. And that's why they call it ambient experiences. So you're going to see that across all the technology uh, vendors where it now includes healthcare. So I'm excited to see how real those things are. Um, but the challenge right now is 2020 is what I'm describing now. It's, it's really the year of focusing on the core foundation. You know, what Cone Health went through right now from this transformation, it's happening everywhere because they're at the right peak to where a lot of these need to be re refreshed, number one. A lot, of, a lot of things are gonna be end of life. So now it's a perfect prime opportunity to fix your foundation. So I, I would say the next two, three years, we're gonna see this, uh, sort of refresh happen from an infrastructure standpoint. So Cone Health just hit the right timing. I'm glad to hear that you guys took advantage of the timing to look at the next generation solutions. And I'm hoping and I'm optimistic that that trend will continue for the other organization. And number three, what I'm also starting to see is there's a trend towards uh, cloud ERPs. So I'm really trying to understand when that is going to, what that way, what is that going to look like? Because now you have folks looking at cloud ERP uh, which is definitely happening. But in addition, some of these large announcements recently of organizations are ripping out their EMR. I mean, multi-million, hundreds of million, billion dollar mm -hmm. implementation, they rip it out to a different vendor. So what do you mm -hmm. do now? Which is the priority? EMR? Cloud ERP? What are you going to do? I mean, that's a huge disruption for the next few years. So I think those are the three trends I'm, I'm uh, looking forward to seeing and just observing and getting some feedback from him. Uh, in addition, for myself, for Louis Health is looking at the next generation solutions because what I'm building out in Shanghai is um, technology that's probably not on the market today. So really understanding uh, from a strategy perspective, some of these major partners that we, we will be working with, what are they looking to build in the next three years? Because nothing's on the market today. So those are the two things really on my radar. I'm hoping to catch up with everyone as well. Very good. Well, <clears throat> hopefully, uh, we're all planning to see each other down there. So hopefully, uh, no, uh, no late announcements about that not happening. So um, looking forward to that. So now we're going to look at our poll results, which I've just shared out with you. I'm going to get our reactions from the panel. Um, CIOs are nowhere near as knowledgeable as they need to be when it comes to HCI. 87% agree with that. Uh, only 13% disagree. So CIOs have some educating to do for themselves. HCI transformation must be actively led by CIOs. It can't be delegated. 50 per, so the majority, 57% agree, but you, see, you have 43% that think that's over the top. And then CIOs of the future will be a master of managing multiple cloud. 83% agree with David, but 17% think you're wrong. You don't know what you're talking about, David. So you know, right. you may want to address those people. So let's get um, each of our panelists to react to anything in the poll they'd like to, anything they either uh, that maybe they disagree with or they totally agree with and makes a lot of sense to them. Doug, can you go first? Yeah, we have to. So, uh, I, and I'll be honest, I actually uh, was in the, uh, for number two and number three, I'm in the minority, uh, but, I'll, but I'll explain why. Uh, so I, I agree, uh, it, and it's not just CIOs, I think, for that number one question. I think we all, as an industry, need to know more about HCI. I, I think that's, that is critical for our success. So I don't think it's just a CIO thing. It's more of a IT in general. Uh, we all need to learn more. Uh, actively being led by CIOs for the HCI transformation. Again, as, as I mentioned, as I think it's, it's, it can be shared, but the CIO still needs to be involved. And that's where I said it's, you know, over the top. It's, again, I think the CTO, depending on how the organization is structured, the CTO can drive some of that. However, it's still, I think the CIO still has to be a part of it, but not 
actively leading it. Uh, and then the managing, uh, the CIO being the master managing, I said over the top only because of just wording. It's, it's not that I don't agree the CIO is going to be responsible for all of that and accountable for all of that. I think it's just really it's, it's the people underneath them. It's uh, again the CTOs, the directors, the engineers who are going to have to be really master puppeteers. David? I think I, I agree with all the, the survey results, but I do have a question for Doug. Can, can I ask him a question, Anthony? Yeah. Sure, sure. So, so I, I had an event and Microsoft was there. Obviously, they were talking about, you know, back up to Azure and the big NDA I had to sign. I, I needed you guys already. Uh, what are you guys really looking beyond just the backup? Would you consider putting your Epic environment in Azure? And number one, can you even do so based on the architecture? Because I have a bias there. When you have a system that's designed on COBOL, which is a programming language from the archaic age, ages, how do you even put that in the cloud environment? That's the next generation. But I would love to hear from your perspective, if you're, if you're able to share that, yes, uh, yeah. your plans. Yeah, so uh, production, I, I'll be honest, uh, production has been a large conversation recently after we were successful with the DR environment. Uh, the, the only holdup is it's, while I could do a better job of estimating DR because again, we were trying to leave services off when not being used. So the ROI, the financial aspects definitely was there. So that's immediately why we jumped on DR. Uh, the, the one thing that we're holding on production and we have to, you know, anyone running Epic understands you have to do a full cutover and do a test. Uh, ours is next week and we're, we're planning on running there for a full week out of so we will be running out of Azure for a full week that's our plans and the reason is so that I can provide some feedback now to the CIO uh, and, and others to say here's the expectation if we were to move production here's how much money it would really be because right now it's a little harder to to understand that from a production standpoint uh, as far as the architecture uh, shockingly uh, as we were going down this tra uh, transformation we were reaching out to Microsoft and obviously to Epic and, you know, and having those conversations. NetApp was a large part and I can go, you know, tremendously in, in you know, into detail about how we had to use a NetApp to kind of make this happen. Uh, so they were a huge partner of ours. Uh, however, um, the, the main pieces is, is, you know, obviously a lot of people get worried about that cache database. Uh, so in the middle of our move, to add to the complexity, we had to actually retool and go or refactor and go from AIX to Linux and then from Linux up to the cloud. Uh, but as it stands, uh, just to give you some, uh, so we use Rubrik as a core backup infrastructure, uh, which was already cloud enabled. We use that for our cloud archiving. So that's where all of our backups are going anyway. Uh, but we decided when we were in Azure to start using some of the native cloud features, at, we actually had a cloud backup and restore that was faster than on-prem. So uh, it is there. It, it again is it's you, you have to really be very specific and Epic is very wonderful around their testing the way that they provide the hardware specs. Uh, they have down to the SKU level exactly how you have to run this environment. Uh, and we were concerned, you know, we were concerned as soon as we started this process that were we going to be able to get to that information, you know, like were we going to be stepping out and we had to provide that on our own. And luckily, Epic has already done that for you. So uh, same uh, reference architecture that they already have, they have it now for Azure as well. Uh, but there, there really was not, uh, a, it's really up to you to kind of go through some of those decision points the same way they do on-prem. Uh, you know, again, what operating system are you running? You know, what load balancer are you running? How are you providing firewalls and things like, so it's all up to you. And then they just provide the reference reference architecture as well as ARM templates. They provided us ARM templates straight out the gate uh, to be able to spin these up. Well, wow. kudos to you guys. That's a great job. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's a great story. And just, just to add on to that real quick. So we're having these exact conversations with Epic on a weekly basis. So every Friday we're meeting with their hosting team, their internal engineering team that's releasing this um, SPATS document, which is, you know, kind of the Bible for uh, infrastructure <laughs> teams that are deploying Epic, right? Um, so really articulating that, you know, what customers are doing like, like Doug and at Cone Health, what they're requesting and, and you, you're seeing this, this massive, um, uh, leap towards, you know, providing Epic DR in the cloud. Um, so we've been fully validated by 
by Epic to run Epic production and DR on all flash arrays on HCI as well as in the cloud leveraging Azure NetApp files, uh, cloud volumes on tap. So there, there are many options out there. It's just, it, re it really comes down to what problems are you trying to solve? Brian, I'm going to give you a chance for any final last word, anything you want to react to in the poll or just you want to wrap us up for today? Yeah, I think, you know, I, I agree with Doug. I'm kind of in the minority on, on both of uh, the last two uh, poll questions. I think HCI initiatives led by CIOs, um, my, my opinion is that the CIOs should find those thought leaders find those individuals in the organization that, that understand the business challenges that need involved and the style would be curator to the board. the board. The board more than likely wouldn't care about what HCI is. It's what problems are you solving? How, how, are, we, how are we bridging this gap? So I think, I think that's, my, uh, that's my take on, on the HCI. All right. All right. Very well. Well, that's about all we had time for today <clears throat> regarding continuing education. For those of you who need a certificate, you can use the final slide in this deck. You'll receive an email when the on-demand recording of this wonderful event has been posted to our site. And if you'd like to sponsor a webinar with us, uh, one of our upcoming webinars, if you want to book a custom webinar, you can reach out to Nancy Wilcox from our team. And you can go to our site to register for our upcoming events. With that, I want to thank our tremendous panel. I think we've gotten an incredible amount of expertise in one spot on a very cutting edge and important topic. So I want to thank everyone for, on the panel for being a part of it, David Chow, Doug McMillan, and Brian Pruitt. And I want to thank NetApp for making this conversation possible. And of course, I want to thank you, our attendees, for coming to our events. So with that, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.